Kenneth Craig is the Anglican Bishop of... Anybody know? I doubt I don't want to trick you like that. He's the Anglican Bishop of Al-Quds, of Jerusalem. <clears throat> He's the Anglican Bishop of Jerusalem, named Kenneth Craig. He wrote a book, and the reason I asked you if you know who he was, any of you ever heard of him? Kenneth Craig. If not, know him. Uh, he wrote a book called The Call of the Minaret. He wrote a book called The Call of the Minaret. And if you've not read that book, then you don't really know how a Christian thinks. This book, The Call of the Minaret, is a manual of how to convert Muslims to Christianity. It's a manual about how to convert Muslims to Christianity. And a crux of the uh, manual teaches trickery. How to appear to be a Muslim, how to go to Muslim countries, how to learn their customs, learn their ways, walk the walk, talk the talk, and then secretly call them to Islam. All of the missionaries you know that are doing this throughout the world trace their understandings back to this guy, Kenneth Craig. He's the father of this type of understanding. This is what missionaries are doing in Iraq. This is what missionaries are doing in Afghanistan. This is what missionaries are doing in Palestine. This is what missionaries are doing in Saudi Arabia under the cover. And many of them have been caught. We know of instances of some of them that have been caught trying to do this. And this is the one thing that I like, you know, that, that I say, you know, that, you know, good for them. This is one thing that a Muslim is forbidden to do. We cannot even fight against them in this way because a Muslim is forbidden to lie. We are forbidden to, you know, to hide ourselves and try to trick people and all of this type of, of foolishness. This is not becoming of a, of a person of, of, of religion. But he wrote this book called The Call of the Minaret. Read it. Any of you that want to deal with, with uh, the Muslim countries and how to help them against these type of missionary attacks, you should read this book because it is being done. There are seminars in the United States, and I can't say in the UK because I don't know, but I guarantee you there are. But there, are sim uh, there are seminars being taught how to follow this manual, how to go to Muslim countries and appear to fit in and blend in and call people to Islam. You know these people that say they were so-called Muslims? These guys that say that I was used to be a Muslim and I converted to Christianity, yeah. this and that? They're trained by these type of people. They were never Muslim. They are never Muslim, and I've been to a number of them, the prominent ones, lectures, and have basically blasted them out. Basically, just blasted them out. You know this guy, Riza Shah? Any heard of this, this Riza Shah, Why I'm Not a Muslim? He wrote the book, Why I'm Not a Muslim? None of you have heard of this guy? He wrote a very famous book, you can find it in bookstores, called Why I Am Not a Muslim Anymore. He says that he was a, uh, at, at one point in time, he was an Al-Azhari scholar. He was an Al-Azhari sheikh was a half is and then he found Jesus and he came to a conference with about five other people who said that they were Muslim grew up in Muslim homes and trained and all of this and because I had a I had a lecture called um, how the Bible led me to Islam and they went and had a lecture the next week how the Quran led them to Jesus little did they know I was still in the city I was still in Houston so I came to their lecture and I sit and I listen. Okay. I came and I sat and I listened to what they had to say and just waited. After all of the rubbish they gave, they gave no textual proof. Everything was about how they feel and how Jesus made them feel and how this made them feel and how that made them feel. Not only did I say, well, making you feel good is no evidence for anything because the drug addict, drug addict will say the drugs make them feel good. Um, but I asked them, I said, I have one question. If any of you can answer it for me, then I'll agree with all of you. I said, actually, I'll ask you two questions. They said, okay. I said, number one, what is the meaning of Tawheed? Number two, tell me how many Sunnah, Salah, Raqqa uh, are in a day. How many Salah, Sunnah should we pray in a day? I said, if you can't do that, then at least tell me what are the number of all the rakas, of all the, the fard salah in one day. You know how many of those they could answer? Zero. I said, so stop playing games with me. Stop playing games with these people. You were never a Muslim. If you don't understand Tawheed and you're telling me you're an Ashari scholar and you can't even tell me how many sunnah rakas in a day. You can't even tell me how many salah, how many rakas to pray for Fajr, Maghrib, Isha and Asr. 
So so just just get out of here with this foolishness. So they, they, they are pretty much rubbish, but they get their understanding from, from this guy. And this guy, Kenneth Craig, wrote in this book called The Call of the Minaret. I read this book many times. He said, not so the New Testament. There is condensation and editing. How many of you know what condensation is? Give me, somebody give me a definition of condensation. The conversion of steam to water, right? The conversion of, of all of the steam compresses itself down. All of the molecules that make it light enough to float then are taken out so that it can become water, correct? That's the rudimentary understanding of condensation. So he said the Bible came through a process of condensation and editing. Condensation and editing. There is choice reproduction. What does that word choice reproduction mean? It means that I reproduce what I choose. In my copying, I choose and I pick what I reproduce. And witness. There's choice witness. I decide who I decide to listen to and not listen to. The Gospels have come through the mind of the church behind the authors. This is the Christian our Anglican Bishop of Jerusalem. That the Bible came from the minds of the church behind the authors. What does that mean to you? That means that people wrote what everyone was thinking. They wrote what people inspired them to write. What the church was believing, they made what they wrote fit into this. And let me tell you, the author of Luke says this. If you read the book of Luke, in the beginning of Luke, he says, I wrote that which was seeming to me. I wrote that which sounded good. That's what he says. I wrote what sounds good. And actually, he was copying from Mark anyway. He just pick and chose. That's what it means by there is choice, reproduction, and witness. Because most Matthew and Luke, without a doubt, and you can find it right here from the sources, copied from Mark. In a lot of places they copied verbatim. They sometimes in order, you, you can't plagiarize Mark because then it's the same book. So what is one of the biggest tricks of plagiarism? What do you do? No, you copy and paste and you shuffle the arrangement. You shuffle the arrangement. This is what you find in Matthew and Luke. And then sometimes you change the wording so that it does not look plagiarized. But to anyone who knows plagiarism, they'll pick it up right away. And, 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 and all of, almost all of the biblical scholars of Astute have said that Matthew and Luke are a plagiarism of Mark. And Mark was copying from a, a text we know as the Q, the Q document which does not exist anymore, but it's a reference that some of the early church fathers like Eusebius referred to, that they said Mark got his information.